details attended to. Um, and there's a, a little review on the chat. Um, I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees from this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and I want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are both crucial to our success. So with that, I am uh, thrilled to welcome today's presenter, Carolyn Morgan, who's one of our fabulous OCLC colleagues. Um, and I am turning things over to her. Carolyn, the screen is yours. Hello, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, let's say thank you, Mary Lee, for that awesome introduction. And thank you to the RLP for um, giving us a, a chance to present you your personas today. Um, before I get started, I want to apologize for any background noise that you may hear. Um, my neighbors have decided that 11 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time is the time to do yard work. Um, so you might hear the lawnmower and weed eater in the background, and I apologize. Um, so today we'll be talking about user personas and how we can use those in the library. Um, I want to give a little introduction to myself. I'm kind of we are all that neighbor, exactly. I am that neighbor oftentimes. Um, so introduction to myself, my name is Carolyn Morgan. I am a UX researcher here at OCLC. I um, am part of the user experience and visual design team, um, but I'm embedded in most all product teams as well. So um, I've worked on things from discovery to WMS to question points. Um, I've been working at OCLC for about two and a half years now. Um, before that, I was in academia, so for about 15 years, I've been doing uh, research on people and their behaviors and the role their emotions play um, on their decision making. So I have a, I hold a PhD in political science, um, looking at political psychology. So what I've done um, for my career now is taken that expertise and brought it to the library uh, space, especially in terms of software. So what we'll be talking to about today is, um, I'll give you an introduction to the UX uh, and visual design team at OCLC to kind of situate ourselves. I'll talk a little bit about what a user persona is, and then I'll walk you guys through how to create your own user personas and how to situate those in libraries. And then we'll wrap up by going over a checklist, you know, the, kind of, okay, I have these 10 things, let's get started. And then um, the portion I'm most looking forward to is the discussion and Q&A. So, and as Marilee said, um, if you guys have any questions at all throughout this um, presentation, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, I watch the chat window a lot while I'm talking because I just want to make sure I'm hitting all the questions. Um, and yes, please do use all participants, because um, otherwise we won't see it as panelists. Um, but yeah, definitely put in those questions as you um, as you have them, and we'll make sure that we can address them. So before we get started, I want to know um, what you guys know. I want to make I want to kind of gauge how you guys feel about personas. So I want to make sure that I'm talking to the right uh, talking at the, the right level. So um, we have set up a poll everywhere, and Mary Lee, I think you have to take presenter, uh, right? Yeah. So Mary Lee's going to help walk us through how to do these polls. Um, and Mary Lee, do you want to? Yeah. So I put a I put a link into pot into chat. So if you just open up a um a, a browser tab uh, and go to uh, pollev.com/oclc. You can uh, just put on this little map, you can put a little push pin uh, to show us where you are on your, on your user persona journey. Um, and we're going to come back and do a couple more polls to keep this kind of interactive. So I'm seeing some people who are some solid fours. We've got a seven, um, somebody who's a little further on on their journey. Also a two, this is awesome. Uh, a lot of people here to learn today. 
Uh, this is great. I love seeing these little pins just kind of land on the map. Um, got some, got some sixes. So this is great. We've got um, people are all over the place, and we've got a lot of things to learn. Um, I'm going to go. I'm going to keep this uh, open, but I don't want to take away um, much time from uh, from Caro. So this poll is going to remain open for a couple minutes, and I'm going to turn things back over. Uh, to Carolyn so that she can um, take us through. But thank you so much for sharing with us. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and I am, uh, I don't know how many of you all have um, interacted, with this, interacted with me one at OCLC, but I like to give out all the energy that I can. So this is like seeing this, seeing you guys interact, just makes me even more excited about this. So um, let's talk a little bit about the UX and visual design team at OCLC. So what we do um, for UX research, we work with visual designers, we work with the developers, we work with um, UX designers, we work with product teams, just about anybody who works on a product, we work with them. And what we do uh, with the research team is we look at all sorts of data points. We look at interviews, we look at how we observe people using the software, we look at the feedback community center. We look at secondary research, so what's being published, uh, published in academic research, what's being published on blogs, what's being published on our own OCLC research blog, right? We pull in all those data points, and then we look, look and see, okay, how can we make experiences with our software better, right? We want to see how users are using our software, what's their goals, motivations, what are users trying to do, and we want to make that better by using data-informed uh, design, or sorry, by implementing data-informed design. So we work with the visual design team and the uh, user experience design team to make sure that what we're building, what our tools are, match what our users are expecting, right? So if you think about how the user experience design, the visual design team come in, is they look at, okay, what tools are users using? They're on Facebook, cool. So they understand how that user journey or how that workflow goes. They're using Excel, cool, okay. So they get that understanding, they pull those design principles in. And so together, coming from a research um, background and then having those design backgrounds come together, we bring in that analytical mindset and that creative mindset to build software. So you guys are probably wondering, okay, Thanks for, thanks for that overview, but what's this have to do with a persona, right? What is a persona? So, again, we have another little quiz coming up. This is totally, this is a very interactive session. Um, so I want to apologize if you were like me and I just wanted to sit here and listen. You can totally sit here and listen too if you want. But I want to see what you guys think a persona is. So, again, if you go to that poll there, you can um, click on A, B, or C. Um, tell me what you think a persona is. And again, we have somebody uh, uh, who who uh, clicked on this. Um, so I don't know if there's any other. Uh, if everybody's all on the same place, okay. So we've got mm -hmm. we've got a couple. We've got some votes for. Uh, for number two, a bunch of votes for number three. Anybody like any other options? I see that two is losing ground there. People are losing their confidence. Maybe we should have had this be like a, a poll. There's an option in this poll. I'm just learning how to use this polling tool, which is pretty cool, actually. There's an option where I can do a big reveal. Um, so maybe this would have been a good one to uh, to do that. Maybe I'll set up the next poll that way. Um, but I'm going to turn things back over. Uh, I'm going to keep that open for a couple minutes, and I'm going to turn things back over to Carolyn, and let's check out and see what the answer is. That poll reminded me watching the percentages change. It reminded me of a horse race, um, and I don't know if that's like my Kentucky route showing through or not, but I think that would be really cool to show. Um, so, journal please, it's C. Um, personas are fictional yet realistic descriptions of a typical or a target user of the product. 
Um, so if you gave yourself, if you answered C, give yourself a big round of applause. Um, and if you didn't, that's okay. Like that is why we are here. So a user persona is essentially a simplified and memorable presentation of the user who's uh, using your product, the user who is going through those experiences when using your product. So a few things about personas um, before we move forward. One is that personas, there's not a thing as one persona that works or one formula for a persona that works for every single product or every single team, right? Personas are tools. Um, they are meant to improve how your team or your uh, group designs or builds a thing for others. Okay, so the personas, if you Google um, user personas, you're going to see so many different variations. You're going to see some like um, MailChimp, their personas are just pictures of people with adjectives around it, right? Because that's what works for their team, right? You can see some personas that are, they don't even have pictures and they just have bullet points where, you know, this user needs this, this user wants to do this. You can see some that are playing cards. You can see some that are trading cards. Um, there's so many different ways to make personas. So what we'll be presenting today is how we do it at OCLC. We are actually, um, our user experience and visual design group are in the middle of updating all of our personas. Um, we are updating personas, we're updating user journeys and establishing that baseline or reestablishing the baseline from which we will then do continuous research um, to make sure because in the past few years, there's been a shift in how people use technology. And I don't have to tell you guys this, like the libraries from five, 10 years ago are not the libraries of today, right? And the libraries even of tomorrow might be completely different from the libraries of, of last year. And so what we do as a team, as we said, okay, when we're going through design work, when we're doing everything, what are the important um, what are the important factors that we need to know? What are the things that we are really missing out on that we want to make sure that we're hitting? And so we came together and said, okay, for our personas at OCLC, we need to know their role in the library. Right? What's their title, right? What are they doing? What are their needs? Right? What doing their job in this software, in this experience, what do they need to do? Why do they want to do it? Right? What's their motivation? Um, Mary, uh, Mary Lee Mercy and I were talking before and I was like, why do people do that? And they're like, you really are a researcher, right? Like, you really do want to know why people do things. And that helps us, but even why? Because it helps us design for it, right? You want to know their workflows. Why are they using this tool to accomplish that thing, right? How, how does that tool fit in today? We want to know what other tools they're using, right? So um, if librarians are using Excel, Awesome. We want to know why they're using Excel and how this, how what we're building in the software world fits with Excel, right? And then we also want to know their pain points and their challenges. So part of my career goal, and I think part of any software developer designer's goal is to help people out, right? And that, um, I think that it shares a lot in common with librarians, right? Every librarian I've talked to is like, I just want to help people. And so to understand how to better help people, we got to understand their pain points and challenges. So taking all of that information for our team is important to make that available to everybody who's working on that product, everybody who's working on that problem. And we want to make sure it's a baseline tool. So we want to make sure that when we're talking about you know, our circulation librarian, or we're talking about our reference desk person, they we're all talking about that same person. We all have that same person in mind. They so probably wonder, okay, Carol, how do you do this? Like you said, you gather data and you work with secondary resources and you work with interviews and observations. You got all this data. How do you pull it together? Right? So this is one of the graphics from um, Spotify. And I really love how Spotify tells the story of how they develop their persona. So we're going to talk about that for the next few slides. And I really love how they presented this. Um, I couldn't find a better way to do it. So um, hats off to Spotify for this. What they, what we do as researchers is we combine 
all these little facts and all these little um, tidbits, right? We're seeing, um, if we want to say the blue points, those are the goals and motivations from users, right? And the red points, those are those points of those issues. And so we just gather all of these little factoids and data points, and then we start looking for patterns. Um, personas are tools that help us understand the patterns of our users, right? So what we do is we look at this and say, okay, so if you imagine we're looking at those blue dots and we say, oh, okay, so when we see those dots, we also often see these pain points, we cluster them together, right? Um, and you just continue to do that and you'll see, you know, the more data you gather, the, the more nuanced those clusters get. So what we want to do when we're looking at this data is we want to make sure that we're not trying to accommodate every single edge case, right? Um, because um, you're not going to be able to design a software or design a program, even like a library program, you can't design it to fit everybody, right? But you want to make sure that you get most a, a good chunk of the people, right? And determining what that good chunk is, that's something your team and you and your business has to, you know, as a business has to sit down and say, okay, we want to make 80% of the customers or the users happy. We want to make 90% of the customers or users happy. So a lot of this, um, a lot of this depends on what your library strategy is, right? Um, so looking for those clusters and being able to see, okay, so that's a good percentage of our group, you know, we want to make sure that we're hitting them and them. Uh, when we, when we implement this program or we implement this feature, right, who's that going to affect? And, and so what the personas do is it, it brings in the human into what we're building, right? Um, it helps us to remember that the program that we're building or the software that we're designing or the rule that we're putting forward has a human on the end of it. So I'm going to pause here for a second. Um, if you have any questions on um, the data or how to collect it, we're going to talk a little bit about that um, coming up. But I want to um, see if you have any questions so far. And I'll take just a second, watch the chat box. I don't see anything just yet, and it can take a little bit for people to uh, type their questions in. So why don't we, yeah. Yeah, we'll move on to the next one. So while you're thinking of questions, I have a question for you guys. And it is, um, how many personas does Spotify have? How many do you think? So Spotify, um, just to make sure everybody uh, knows what it is, Spotify is a music platform. You can get it, you can either do it as a, um, a senior browser or an app. And you can get podcasts, you can get music, you can get news. Uh, there are a lot of things you can get on Spotify. It's kind of like an internet radio. Um, so yeah, tell me, uh, how many perso personas do you think that Spotify has? Okay, so we're trying a different, a different approach with Poll Everywhere. I modified the poll so we can see that we've got a total result, 13 people uh, mm -hmm. total taking it. So should we, you think we should... Uh, I think we should see do the big reveal, see what people think. Yeah. Let's okay. do it. Let's see what the responses are. Oh. Okay. There we go. Awesome. So let's let's uh let me just switch back over to you. Awesome. I love seeing that distribution of answers, you guys. This is great. So Spotify has five personas. Um, and so here's the thing about personas is that they are considered a piece of business intelligence because they um, they basically influence how you're building your how you're building your product, right? Oh, that's a per Mary, that's a perfect question. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit too. Perfect. So um, Mary asked, how do we address accessibility needs when creating user personas? So um, the five Spotify personas, they don't tell us what these uh, personas stand for, right? They tell us their names, but they don't tell us what they're doing. And the reason is because it's business intelligence. Now, Spotify, if you Google Spotify user personas, 
um, of research for them, you'll see so many case studies on it because it's become one of those UX design case studies, like what are Spotify's personas, right? Um, so am I, you know, knowing what I know of Spotify, you know, we could say that Nick is a student, Olivia is a curator, um, Shelly is a commuter, uh, Travis is a business, right? And Cameron is either an artist or a publisher. Those five types of people, those five types of groups, they all use Spotify. They use the same tool, right? They're using the same interface, but they're using it for different reasons. A student might be using it for study music. Um, a curator might be building playlists because she's, you know, a DJ at night, right? And she wants to make some really good playlists. Uh, Shelly might be listening to it during a commute um, for her podcast. Uh, Travis might be using it for his business because he's got that background music, you know, maybe like a restaurant or, uh, you know, some jazz for a shop. And Cameron might be a singer himself. He might be a musician and he's publishing his music to Spotify. And you can see how these five different people with these five different motivations are using the same interface. So that's kind of what we do also. So why personas? Again, they help to humanize data to remind us that our design decisions, how we build things, affect people. Um, they help us to design for multiple users without exclusion but priority. And so this is where I'm going to address Mary's question of how do we incorporate accessibility needs when creating user personas. So um, accessibility is not a feature, right? It's not a design feature. It is something that all designers, all people who are creating, and when I say designers, I mean people who are creating programs, um, not only software, but also in physical spaces, right? We need to be thinking about that because if we're excluding people, um, we're saying you can't use our product, right? Um, you can't use the thing that we built. We want to make sure that when we're building that software, we're thinking, okay, um, you know, all these personas, you know, um, if we go back, I'm going to go back a slide real quick. If we look at these five Spotify user personas, we shouldn't say, um, you know, the musician, ha he's colorblind and the business person is um, has hearing difficulties. We should just say, you know, these people can have these difficulties. We need to start thinking about it and incorporating it in there. So um, some things that I've seen businesses do and uh, it works really well to make sure that we're addressing accessibility is they have an accessibility persona, right? Um, and yeah, Mary, uh, Mary Lee and Mercy have really great. So we just did a webinar on accessibility there. Um, they have the link in the chat. You want to make sure that we're not thinking about accessibility as an add-on, right? We want to make sure that we're including it in there. So for us, um, and our personas at OCLC, we don't have an accessibility persona. We just put it in with it, right? We put it in with our design. Um, we have it actually as part of our design check, or we're putting it in as part of our design checklist. Um, and as a researcher, you know, I'm doing my due diligence to make sure that when I'm when I'm doing a study on something, you know, it's also hitting those accessibility checkpoints. That's a great question, though. Um, so again, why personas? Um, we want to make sure that we're finding common out, common denominators among our users. And it's not just about the product, but it's about that experience, right? It's not just the interface, it's that experience. So um, if we think about Gmail or Google Suite, right, you have the person who's reading their email, but you also have a developer who's building out on the back end of that. Um, you have Alexa, which is an interface, right? Um, it's that, that voice interface, is that voice experience. Um, so that's something, you know, when you're thinking about, when you're thinking about um, interactions, right? It's not just a clicking a button on a screen. It's, um, I can't use Alexa because it doesn't understand my accent, right? Um, it's, it's things like that. What happens when you don't use a persona? Um, when you don't use a persona, we get what's called scope creep or feature creep. Um, where we start to try and build for everybody, right? So if we look here, you know, this is uh, a Photoshop exaggeration that you can see, you know, 
oh, someone wanted a strike through button and someone wanted a bold button and someone wanted this. So you end up, you know, you're losing the forest for the trees. Personas help us to make sure that we build the right thing and we build the thing right. So what you're seeing here is um, it's the double diamond of design. So the first stage of any design process or any building process is make sure that we're, we're building the right thing, we're doing the right thing. And then we go through and say, okay, we did the thing and did we do it right? And the persona, the person who, or you know, that user group who we're, who we're building this for remains that constant. Right. There's a lot, if you look at this double diamond and you think of like a fluctuation, right? So there's going to be good times and we are hitting it and there are low times but we're not hitting it. Totally that uh, persona keeps us constant. It keeps us focused on who we're building for and why we're actually building this thing, right? Um, I'm sure I'm probably not the only one here who I've gotten to, you know, halfway through one of those diamonds and I'm like, why am I even doing this project? Like. Why, who am I doing this for, right? The personas help us to remember, who am I doing this for? Oh, I'm doing it for this person to make their job a little better. So we have a different kind, a couple of different kinds of personas. And I wanna bring this into the library space because I've been talking a lot about software and products and this and that. I wanna bring this into the library space so you guys can start to visualize how you will use this, right? So let's, our example will be a library space redesign. So let's imagine we haven't updated our library since, I don't know, I'll pick a year, 1987, right? And we need, we need some funding. We need, we need some resources to update it. We got to think first, okay, first, who are we doing this for? And we're going to just say it's an academic library space for now. Who are we doing this for? Well, our primary people, that's our students, right? Right, the students come in and they're using this space to study, and they're, you know, the um, they're here to study, to use computers, to get resources. But we also have faculty coming in, right? They're not our faculty are not our first people coming in. They're not the first people who come to mind, but we're also working for them. So that's our secondary persona. Then we have supplemental personas. Those are people who they're going to use our space, they're going to use our product, but you know, they're they're in. They're out. They're they're not on number one, number two. Now, customer or buyer personas. Those are the people who we they give us the money. They give us the tools to to do this thing, right? Um, the provost, in our example, will grant us the funds to do the library space redesign. But they got to be on board. They got to see why you know why we want to do this redesign. We also have our served personas. So those are very similar to our supplemental personas, except for they reap the benefits, right? So the general public reaps the benefits of a library space because you have more people coming in, you have more people who are engaged, you have a larger um, civic discourse, you have a larger um, civil society coming through, like all these things that come out of library spaces and public spaces, right? But we're not immediately thinking of them when we're building the design. Again, we're thinking of that primary and that secondary persona normally. But these other people have to be taken into consideration, but we're not building for them. And then our last but not least persona is our negative persona. Um, I've heard these called negative personas, dark personas, um, the bad personas, right? These are the people who will use our design, will use our product, for no good. These are our baddies. Uh, if you're thinking about um, bank software, it's a hacker, or any kind of computer software, it's a hacker, right? Uh, library space redesign, it could be a hacker coming in and using the public computers. It could be, uh, I don't know, someone coming in wanting to do a party. I don't know, just someone who's using the, per the space, using that product for something that it wasn't intended to do that has a negative outcome kind of your worst case scenario persona. So we went through, um, talked a little bit about why personas are used, kind of how we, or, you know, what personas uh, come from. Now let's talk a little bit about creating user personas. So I have a seven step process to building personas. 
Um, I'm going to walk you guys through them. There's a few of them where we're going to take a couple of brain breaks. Because um, my goal from this webinar is that when you're done with this webinar, you can say, okay, we're ready to go. Let's do our persona stuff. And I want you guys to feel confident that you can do this or at least, you know, know what you have to do. So first, you have to get your stakeholders together to build some hypotheses. We are researchers, we are scientists, and we gotta build hypotheses. We gotta know what we know before we start to go out and figure out things that we didn't know before. I know that sounds convoluted, but hear me out. We gotta talk to our people, we gotta talk to our stakeholders and see what they know about these people. We gotta build what we call proto-personas, these hypotheses, because then, we can start asking questions. We can start questioning our understanding, right? We can draw from a library staff experience saying, okay, you know, we see patrons doing X, Y, Z, but we don't know why. Perfect, you don't know why. That's where we start our interviews from. That's where we start to dig in for that data. So we're gonna take a three minute brain break. I ask y'all to get a pen and piece of paper or a pencil and piece of paper and I'd like you to, to think about who would be at your stakeholder session, right? And go ahead and write down those names for you. Um, yeah, our time will start now. And if you have any questions on this, you, yeah, you can write these things in the chat. You have any questions on how to identify these stakeholders, throw them in the chat. Um, I am more than happy to answer it. I wish we had the Jeopardy music for the background. I'm going to do something completely crazy, and I'm going to set up a poll everywhere so that people can put their things into poll everywhere. That would be cool. We have about two more minutes on this. And if you're struggling to think about who your stakeholders would be, one thing I did uh, when I first started at OCLC was I drew a map of everyone who I was interacting with and started thinking, okay, so this person works with that person who works with that person. And I, by the time I got done, I had a big, big paper full of just like webs and maps of people who I could talk to. Um, and just started, you know, talking to those people and asking them. And it wasn't a big, for me, it wasn't a big question. It was those hallway conversations got a lot of information. So that might be something, that might be a way for you to, to start thinking about who you're going to talk to. So I've um, opened up Poll Everywhere again. If people want to just put some things into, um, in there, uh, it'll start to create a word cloud. Um, so. This is just a little on the fly activity because I've learned a new tool. <laughs> um, so if people want to put things in there, or maybe you're just quietly reflecting, either way is fine. Patrons, yes. Administration. Ooh, donors is a good one. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> wow. Marketers, yeah. Oh, this is fun. This is amazing. Ooh, Mary Lee, this will be good for the next activity that we have, too. Yeah. Oh, this is exciting. Cool. I can hold on to this. Um, do you want to uh, switch back over to the slides, or? Uh, yeah, let's do. It. Let's switch back over to the slides and. Okay, so I'll keep. Started. Yeah. I'll keep this. I'll keep this open, um, but I'm going to hand back over to Carolyn 
so that uh, we can continue on this. This is amazing, guys. Thanks. That's exciting. Awesome. So once you have all your stakeholders together, right, you want to start to identify user attributes, right? And so when we're talking about attributes, we're talking about um, those you know, needs, motivations, pain points, um, all of those, those factors that you as a team, right, or you as a designer said, okay, these are important to know for building out that project or building out that program. And then start looking at that and focusing on the why, right? So in user uh, user research and just research in general, we have this this, uh, this rule we call the five whys, right? We want to get to the root cause of things. We want to know why at the heart of, at the end of the day, why does that thing happen or why do people want that? So if you have why approximately five times, you'll get down to the root cause. Um, I used to do that as a kid, and I told my mom about this five lies. She was like, yeah, you've been doing that for a few a few decades. So then once you've identified those user attributes and you figured out why, like what's the why you want to know, right? Um, you write up, you know, you write up your user or your interview script or you write up your protocol of how you're going to do it. And again, that depends on how you want to, how you want to go about collecting your data. So you got to start thinking about how are we going to talk to these users, right? How are we going to talk to these patrons and these administrators? You don't want to get secondhand knowledge. You don't want to start playing telephone and using that as data. You want to talk to the real people who are going to be affected by that, right? So you got to start recruiting them. Now, here's where we have another group action. Um, so Mary Lee, I don't know if you want to set up that next word cloud. Yeah, so we want to do another little group activity. And I put three minutes down here, but if we start to go, like if it starts to get really good, we can go to five because uh, we, where we're at in the presentation, we could probably go to five so long as it's really good and active. But I want to know how you guys, thinking about who your stakeholders are and who your users are, how would you guys recruit participants? So again, this is a, a word cloud, and this is very experimental, you guys. This is uh, we're just we're we're really just setting up these polls on the fly, and uh, let's see if I can make this go full screen. Um, I really like that word cloud. Whoa, cool. Food, yes, pizza. <laughs> yes, there it pizza is. Pizza, pizza. Sp food specifically, pizza. Uh, yeah. Gift certificate, twenty-five dollar gift certificate. Amazon. One of, mm -hmm. one of the best advices I got, or pieces of advice I got when I went into grad school was sign up for all the research because you usually get free food. So it works. Open house. Oh, I want to hear a little bit more about that open house. That'd be cool. Yeah, incentives. Right, like an open house, like have it um, kind of an insider event, get to see behind the scenes, to go to workshops, coupons, nice, mm -hmm. build some partnerships by uh, by getting coupons for um, for something else that are, is related. Okay. Social media is a way to do outreach. Nice. So some of these are incentives, and some of these are um, are ways for uh, getting the word out about your event. I think. These are okay. Yeah, these are these are amazing. <laughs> I love seeing this. I might have to brainstorm with you guys later. Man, you guys have some really good ideas. That's right. We're gonna bring you. We're gonna bring you guys all back <laughs> in um, for the next time. Okay, Man. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn things back over to you. Yeah, and that open house. More. We're definitely gonna hold on to this. Yeah, that open house idea was really good. I hadn't thought about that. That's new. Cool. So you go through. Uh, you recruit your people. You do the open house. You do um, emails. You figure out how to get your people together, and then you start collecting data. 
So again, you can do primary data collection or you can do secondary. I like to go with primary because I like to make sure my data are collected cleanly. Um, I like to know how the sausage is made, so to say. Um, and I like to do one of my preferred methods or interviews. And I don't call them interviews. I call them chats. They're just like coffee chats, right? I just sit down and I talk to the people. I usually ask about maybe three or four questions. Um, and it's usually, you know, tell me a little bit about how you got into the library world. Tell me why you like being in the library or don't like being in the library. Um, if a genie granted you three wishes uh, about the library, what would those three wishes be? You can't ask for more wishes and you can't ask for another genie. Um, and then I ask him like, hey, you know, tell me what gets you through the day? What's the one thing you look forward to in your job? Those, for, for what we do for our persona, those four questions usually get me all the data I need and it usually takes about an hour. Um, I, those, doing those interviews is the best part of my day. Um, and I love collecting it, that data. And then you break it down into little snippets. So you start to, um, so you start to analyze the data, you break it into snippets, and you start to see, you know, if you uh, interview, let's say, four reference librarians, and you say that all of them say they would like to have more comfortable chairs or something, you know that that's an insight, right? So you start to analyze, and you see these, you start to see these patterns come up. So then you document, and you um, you document and you curate your persona data. Um, and then, you know, you make it into that format that you wanted. For us, um, we have, it's more of a poster type, right? So you have picture, and then you have, you know, the roles, motivations, pain points. Um, and then last but not least, you need to continuously update your personas. Again, people evolve, technologies evolve, workflows evolve. Um, your persona's got to evolve too, because if you're not continuously updating and you're not continuously continuously um, improving your personas, then you're creating your programs and your design for the people of the past. And we always want to be looking towards the future. So here are some tips on personas. First, don't use them in isolation. Don't use them for the UX team. We don't use them just on the UX team. So if we, when we're talking to design, we're talking to developers, um, when I'm talking to anybody, I'll be like, oh yeah, here's our persona, right? And I show them. Um, communication and context are important. So if people don't know, if someone doesn't know what a persona is, teach them. Tell them this is this is the tool that we use to make sure that we're building for for our people. All right. Um, don't just take the average of your users together. Um, if you just do a mixture of all the users together, you end up with like a Mr. Potato Head, right? Um, we want to make sure that when you see this persona, when you see this little um, write-up, you can be like, oh, yeah, that reminds me of so-and-so. We want to make sure that it conjures up this image or this idea of a real person. Don't put too many descriptions in there. You'll notice on our OCLC personas, we don't have their hobbies. We don't have their demographics. We don't have uh, what their favorite food is. Why? Because for us, that's not important, right? If someone's favorite uh, ice cream is caramel ice cream, it doesn't matter if they're using, if that doesn't affect how they're using WMS, right? We want to make sure that what we're putting in there is important to our design. Don't try and put too much extraneous information in there. Yeah, it helps us to, you know, think about this person as a human, but it doesn't help for the tool. And again, remember, personas are tools. They how to work for your team's purpose. Um, designing the persona, building the tool to become a tool is hard, and you're going to have to iterate on it a couple of times. Don't feel like your first persona has to be the you know, black persona or that last template. We have went through, I think, five or six templates um, on our team just to make sure we get it right. So how do you use personas? You can use them in a variety of ways. I'm going to show you a few ways that we use it. Um, and then I've seen other teams use it. You can use Mont for empathy maps. So see, like you have your user in the middle. And that helps us to think about what they say, think, uh, say, think, do, and feel. Um, what I really like to do is I like to put them on journey maps because you can actually see where that person is 
uh, or that group of people are throughout the process. And it puts, takes them out of isolation and puts them in the whole. So you can see, for example, um, with the Pratt Institute, you can see that they have, you know, they have the patron enters the library, walks into the stacks, finds the section, locates the book, selects the book, borrows the book, and exits the library. You can see how that person goes through that whole workflow, that whole journey. Um, I really love seeing personas on the whole. I don't like seeing them when we're just looking at that one slice because you end up maybe forgetting, you know, how that one slice affects five steps down the road. So let's talk a little bit about personas and libraries. So personas and libraries, um, you often have them in three different ways. Or ways. So first, dealing with the digital interfaces. Second, with your services and offerings. And then third, with service design. These, um, if you're wondering about library-specific personas and you're struggling or you want to see like how has someone else done it and you want to start building off of it, I highly recommend going to the Pratt Institute's website. Uh, they, I don't know if anybody on the in the chat or the attendees are from the Pratt, but they have done a great job. Thank you guys so much. Um, when I first got into the library world, I relied on their uh, resources so much, and they are top notch. Um, again, this is an example of service design in libraries, so you can see how they go through that whole journey. I love seeing service design. Service design is the, the whole picture, right? That is the environment. That's the way that the room is laid out, how it interface, interacts with the interface, how it interacts with the people behind the counter. And this is what that data collection process looks like, right? It's going to get messy. It's going to be a little bit disorganized, and that's okay. Uh, that, that chaos and that messiness, you know, you massage it a little bit, and those insights start to come out. So um, the reason I wanted to show this picture, and again, this comes from Pratt, thank you Pratt so much, um, is it shows that, you know, you're going to have a lot of data. Um, the building personas, building user journeys, building these service design blueprints takes a lot of work. Um, so don't get discouraged. Um, I am in, in uh, I think, the 16th month of working on the personas and user journeys at OCLC because they're so big. So here um, are some of the tips for service design. So service design is that, um, that environment and that physical surrounding interacting with the interface. So you want to you want to research those experiences. And you want to build it into a flow chart. So make those journeys, right? And this can also do when you're dealing with digital interfaces. Take that information, put it into a flow chart. Focus on the fail points and those critical steps because you want to make sure that your users and your people can get through those critical points and get um, they can succeed, right? They want to come into your library and do the thing they, they expected to do when they're there. Um, you also have to, and number nine is most important, you want to plan for effective implementation, right? You want to make sure that everybody's on board with these service blueprints. You want to make sure that everyone knows why you're doing it, why it's important, and how they contribute, right? or how they can contribute, sorry. So I just went through about 30-some slides with a lot of information, and we're wrapping up. Here are some additional resources. Um, you're probably looking at this thinking, oh my gosh, this is a whole bunch of information. But these are the top websites that I went to when I started, or some of the websites I went to when I first started at OCLC to get, under, uh, to get up to date on how libraries work and how who's using libraries, why they're using libraries, right? Um, if you have, so we're gonna do Q&A in just a minute. But um, if you have any questions after this webinar, after this Q&A, feel free to hit me up. Um, my email is here, um, morganc at oclc.org. Um, I am more than happy to help you guys. Again, I just threw like two years worth of work at you in a few minutes, um, but I'm more than happy to help you out because if we understand who we're building for, if we understand who we're making these programs for, it makes us all better. 
So that's what I have. Um, Mary, do you want to open it up for Q&A? Absolutely. We want to open it up for Q&A. And I was uh, seeing in the chat, I am, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm learning this new polling tool, Poll Everywhere. I set up those last two polls on the slide. There are on the fly. There is a, um, you don't have to create, uh, put in a username. There's an anonymous version, which is less barrier, you know, less of a barrier. People don't feel like they're being spied on or, or what have you. Um, and I apologize for, uh, Overlooking that in my in my haste, it it defaults to wanting people to put in some kind of a screen name or something. So that's um, that's why you had to do that, and that's my um, my oversight on that. But um, I'm not seeing any any questions, so I'm going to give people a couple moments to put those in. I do want to um, thank Carol for being uh, both an enthusiastic presenter. She really wanted to uh, present to this group and share because uh, she's very passionate about this area of work and wanted to share. Um, here's a question from Bob Kosofsky from um, New York Public Library. I understand the dangers of creating personas that exclude certain groups out of negligence. To rectify, does one just create a new persona and does this influence existing personas? So I think that's kind of going to the idea of this is um, iterative kind of life cycle mm -hmm. sort of thing. So if you're aware that you've uh, excluded a group, mm -hmm. what do you do? This is a very timely question, Bob. That is a perfect question. So um, it can influence existing personas. But personas aren't um, zero sum either, right? You can have personas that overlap. So as you're collecting your data, as you're continuously iterating, and you're like, oh, we have a, we've, we've got a, a open space here. Like, we, there are some issues that we're not addressing. That becomes a persona, right? Or that could become a persona if you're, if that represents a user group. Um, if there is something that, um, if there's something that you're seeing in the data that relates to another persona, go ahead and throw that on there, right? Um, but yeah, you can always create a new persona. Um, if you're seeing that there's a group that you haven't addressed yet, definitely create a new one. Now, with that said, uh, I want to talk. I want to remind us that. We want to be careful of scope creep and feature creep, right? So I would say your optimal your optimal number of personas is about five. Um, that's for any product or experience. Remember that Spotify example. Spotify is huge. Like everybody in the world could use it, right? And they nailed their personas down to five types of people that use it, right? Not just five people that are using it, but five user groups. Um, Yes, I think, yeah, uh, definitely. And that's where, you know, evaluating that data continuously comes in. So um, I just want to, I just want to add one, one small, um, maybe clarifying point here. So one, one might realize that I've, I've recruited, I've recruited students, but, but my student pop, the population that I recruited for my students wasn't actually representative of my student body. I didn't have any black students that I interviewed. Um, you know, it was an all white group of mm -hmm. students. So I think you wouldn't, in that case, create a new persona for no. the needs of black students. You just want to be aware that you're, that you're recruiting to have an inclusive group mm -hmm. to yeah. have input into your persona. So I think mm -hmm. that, that may have been, but yeah. I just, do I have that right? Yeah, so, um, and this actually goes to Mary's next question is, um, oh, where'd it go? Sorry. Uh, here it goes. Can you suggest how many people we interview, such as a certain percentage of our total users or categories of users? So you want to make sure the people who you interview, again, are representative of your, of your population. Any sample you want to take for any research, you want to make sure that it's as closely representative of the general population of that user group as possible. Now, here's how I start with interviews. I usually recruit about eight um, of that user type, user group, or that category. Here's why I do eight. Because you want to reach a number about, you start to see patterns um, about with about six people. Remember, this is qualitative data. So 
um, laws of large numbers and things like that that you see in quantitative and even things like statistical significance don't play here because qualitative data is very different than quantitative data. But you want to go, you want to recruit about eight people because your first one, uh, your interview might not go so well. Interviews are like pancakes. Your first one's always, mm, you can improve on it, right? So that leaves you then with seven. You're going to have probably about one no-show. That leaves you then with about six interviews that you can use. Those six interviews will start to show you patterns. And then you evaluate, okay, we have some weak spots here. We have some uncertainties. Then you build off of that. So I use, but yeah, usually I recruit about eight. That gets you about six interviews that you can use. Um, oh, perfect. Okay, so Nicole, you guys are so great questions. So Nicole asks, once you collect all your data, could you talk more about how you organize and analyze the data you've collected? Any practical advice? So I rely highly on Excel and Miro. Miro is, um, and I will type in the website here in the chat, Miro.com. That is an interactive whiteboard wonder tool. Um, you can make sticky notes, you can draw diagrams, it's interactive. The best thing I like about it is that you can move around sticky notes. And what I do is I usually get my stakeholders together and we work through the data together to find those insights. Um, and, and when I say we work through the data together, we move sticky notes closer together. Um, we look at it, we see, okay, each one of those is like an insight or an observation, and we'll start to pull them together and that sh visually shows our cluster. Um, you can, there's a lot of different ways. If you have, um, like an, or analytics data or usage data, you can collect it. That depends on what kind. Uh, that depends on what kind of software you have too. So, um, but for now, I'd say uh, Miro is your best friend. It's my best friend right now, especially working remotely. Um, and then just iteration, right? So start early with sharing your work and showing sharing your insights. Um, you know, you might have, you might find some insights from six people, share it with your stakeholders, and they might say, oh, let's dig in a little bit more than that. What I do is then I put those insights on top of that draft and show that we're building. So, yeah, someone just suggested that we could have a webinar, cool to tools used by, our, by the research. I think that'd be fun. So. Yeah, that's probably, that's a great place to end things. And just as a reminder, we're always interested in your ideas. So if there's work you're doing at your institution that you think everybody should know about, if you've got a cool tool that you'd love to share with everybody, um, please do, please do let us know. So we're right at the top of our hour today. I want to thank uh, Carolyn for her um, expertise and also her passion for this topic. Um, and for condensing it all. I know when you're an expert on a topic, sometimes it's it's difficult to uh, condense all that you know into a relatively brief presentation. I want to thank you guys for being an amazing interactive audience and uh, just going on the fly with us with Poll Everywhere and everything else. Um, and uh, just I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and we look forward to the next time. So this concludes today's webinar. Thank you, guys.